Olá, bom dia a todos. Sejam muito bem-vindos a este painel para discutir. Um, you are very welcome to this panel. We're going to discuss digital payments in the financial sector. We're going to talk a bit about the availability of these payments, how it can be promoted, and the potential impact on banking competition uh, in the name of Zeta. This panel is going to happen. It's a pleasure to be here, and I would like especially to thank our panelists who accepted our invitation to come and share their knowledge, their experience. Uh, Tom, Renato, Carolina, John, uh, the people who are going to moderate this presentation, and I would like to say that it's an honor. It is a privilege to count with your participation, to be able to hear your experience and your knowledge about this important topic of instant payments in Brazil and Mexico and in other places as well. The starting point of our webinar is the asset that we're going to talk about the instant systems and the deposits. This is a paper that explores how these can promote the competition and increase the efficiency of the system as a whole. This is a discussion that is very important, not only in Brazil, in Mexico, and Latin America, but in truth, in the whole world. Many countries in our region, they uh, have concentrated bank systems, which ends up by not being so efficient. So to have this type of debate where we can put together the perspective of the market and the academic contribution and the regulatory contribution about this topic of how to promote this type of agenda with more competitiveness, more inclusion with the instant payments, this is absolutely fundamental. That's where we're extremely happy to be able to listen today, hear about the comments, Dr. Sergei, about his paper, but especially to be able to debate uh, with the Central Bank of Brazil, the BIF, the different visions and the ex regional experience and also the global perspective. Without much ado, we're here to listen to our guests. So I am going to give the floor to Rafaela Nogueira, who's going to moderate this panel, reiterating the welcome to everyone to listen to the panel, especially those who are contributing to the debate. Thank you very much. And I am sure that we will have a wonderful event. Rafaela, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eduardo. Well, to start officially our uh, event, we are now going to watch a presentation of Sergei Sarcia. He's a PhD from Waldorf School in Pennsylvania, assistant professor in the State University of Ohio. But he was not able to be here live, but he kindly he recorded his presentation in his studio and he it's instant payment so i ask you please to show the video of his presentation Many customers are ready to forego higher deposit rate that small banks would pay to stay with a large bank that offers payment services. But payment services are developing. One of the dimensions of development of payment systems is instant payment systems. Those are technologies for fast payments originally designed for financial inclusion, for making payments more efficient and fast. And examples include UPI in India, FedNow in the US that was launched in July last year, and PIX in Brazil that was launched in November 2020. A unique feature about instant payment systems that are created or set up by central banks is that they have very low entry costs for all banks to enter. So not only large banks, but also small banks have fair access to these technologies. And so I'm studying in this paper if instant payment systems have potential to change the competitive landscape among banks. Specifically, I will argue 
that instant payment systems can increase competition for deposits. Can, they can make small banks more powerful relative to large banks. I will study the question by using data from Brazil. Uh, as you all know, Brazilian central bank launched PIX in November 2020, and the original goal was to allow for within second transfers and payments. Uh, the thing that PIX requires, of course, is to have a smartphone and to have a bank account to use PIX. Large banks were required to join PIX. However, small banks also had cheap access. That's why more than 95% of intermediaries in Brazil joined PIX very quickly after its uh, launch. More than 65% of Brazilians are using PIX for payments and transfers. Primary reasons is that PIX is free for bank households. It doesn't require any approvals. It doesn't have any fees. It is also cheap for banks, and it's very cheap for merchants. So on average, merchants have to pay only 0.2% of transaction to accept PIX as means of payment relative to, for example, 2.2% per LP. That's why after introduction of PIX, it became really popular. So you can see on this graph, how much PIX is used at point of sale for payments. And currently, it's more popular than credit cards and debit cards. My public data, unfortunately, ends at the beginning of 2022, but the new survey evidence shows that PIX is more popular than cash at, at point of sale. So now PIX is the most popular means of payment in Brazil. And to enter my questions, I'm going to use uh, a lot of data coming from Brazil. Uh, for example, uh, I'm going to use municipality level monthly data on PIX transactions. So for each municipality, I observe how much people use PIX. Uh, for example, I know that in January 2021, let's say 1 million Brazilian guys were used in uh, uh, PIX transactions. I combine this with branch level monthly data on banks balance sheet from SBAN, and then a lot of interest rate data uh, or, or municipality level demographics. The problem with just looking at how things change after introduction of PIX is of course endogeneity. So introduction of peaks happened the same time when COVID-19 happened. So you can think that maybe people wanted to use digital payments because they were stuck home. And maybe people wanted to move to small banks because at the time interest rates were really low and people wanted to open accounts at small banks. So for reasons unrelated to peaks. So to get causal inference, to get uh, causal estimates, I'm going to use relaxing of COVID-19 restrictions in Brazilian municipalities. So during summer of 2020, many municipalities decided to relax COVID restrictions in Brazil. And then in September 2020, there was a survey conducted by Ministry of Health that asked all the municipalities if they relaxed COVID restrictions or if they kept them in place. And I'm going to use that survey as an instrument for use of PICS. The idea is that easing of COVID restrictions leads to more use of PICS. So for example, if you live in the area that relaxed COVID restrictions, it means that you will spend more money on things. You will travel, you will go to restaurants, to parties. More importantly, you will hang out with your friends more. So you will transfer more money, which PIX is used a lot for. Second assumption is exclusion restriction. So I'm assuming that the only way easing of COVID restrictions by September can impact changes to deposit concentration in November is through PIX. So let's say Rio de Janeiro relaxes COVID restrictions in September and people want to switch to small banks because of that, I'm assuming that if they switch in November, they will do it because PIX was introduced and not because of COVID restrictions that were relaxed two months before that. By using the identification strategy, I find the main result of my paper. So I find that introduction of PIX led to a significant increase in checking deposits and time deposits and also loans of small banks relative to large banks. So for example, one standard deviation increase in value of PIX transactions, which is approximately 100%. So doubling in PIX transactions would increase checking deposits of small banks by 3.3% relative to deposits of large banks. To get better interpretation, I'm going to regress the measure of market concentration, the Herfindahl-Hichman index. So this number is close to one for monopolies and it's close to zero for perfect competition. I'm going to see how this measure changed uh, if value of PIX transaction per capita per person change. First of all, you can see that before introduction of PIX, there was no change in uh, concentration. So it's not the case that deposit markets were already becoming less concentrated. However, after introduction of PIX, there is a reduction in herfindahl hishman index, which means that deposit markets become more competitive. To interpret this number, 
think of average, think of some municipality in Brazil with five banks of equal size. You can think of top five banks in Brazil, which are the largest banks. Now, let's say that average person starts using 200 US dollars more in PIX. So I find that this would lead to creation of the sixth bank. So instead of five banks of equal size, you have six banks of equal size. And there are a lot of anecdotes uh, suggesting that this magnitude is correct. For example, a new bank grew a lot since introduction of PIX and became one of the largest uh, banks in Brazil. Uh, and PIX, I think, contributed to this a lot. And there are examples of other small banks or other uh, fintechs that also grew a lot because PIX was introduced and they could compete better now with top five than they did before. I also find that small banks reduce their deposit rates relative to large banks. So small banks generally have to pay higher deposit rates. But after introduction of PIX, they're able to reduce deposit rates because they no longer need to pay very high rates to attract depositors. I also find that uh, small banks start reacting less to changes to policy rates, while large banks have to actually react more. So now when uh, Central Bank of Brazil changes interest rates, large banks cannot keep their rates very low. They have to increase them to become more competitive. Also, large banks become less profitable relative to small banks, so they cannot extract as many profits from their uh, deposits as they did before. And finally, large banks do not cut lending as much as they lose deposits. And the reason is large banks have access to uninsured financing, like wholesale funds, borrowing from other banks. So there is no problem with actual lending by large banks. They are fine. Potentially, there are increased risks because the funding is uninsured. And finally, let me talk a little bit why I find this results. So PIX increases payment and transfer convenience of small banks. But people in richer and poorer areas react to payment convenience differently. So for example, richer people care about deposit rates that uh, small banks pay more because they have savings. But poor people, they care more about things like how much the account of the bank costs, uh, what is the salary, COVID stimulus, access to ATMs. So I find, consistent with this, that my results are stronger in richer areas. So people move to small banks much more in the richer areas, whereas people in poorer areas prefer to move to large banks after PIX is introduced. And the reason is poor people, uh, poorer areas, they don't care as much about interest rates, but they do care about services that large banks provide. Is my, is my result driven by unbanked population or by people who were already in the banking sector? So I find that my results are mostly driven by areas where there is a big share of banked population. So people who are already in banking sector, they prefer to move from large banks to small banks. Whereas people who were previously unbanked, they're more likely to open their accounts at a larger bank. And the reason is same. Most of them open their accounts to get COVID checks or maybe just because they need some bank account to use PIX and large bank is more convenient because there are many ATMs, many branches and uh, free accounts and also direct deposit salary accounts, which are free at large banks. And finally, I look at what happens to deposit demand in Brazil. So the idea is to see what happens to deposit demand when, when deposit rates change. And generally, deposits are very sticky. People don't like to move even if deposit rates change. However, this changes after introduction of PIX. So since PIX was introduced, people became more sensitive to deposit rate changes. So now if my bank doesn't change deposit rate, but the other bank does, I'm more likely to move because PIX allows me to move easier. I can make free transfers. I can have two bank accounts. So this thing become really easy after introduction of PIX. So this, is, this implies reduced market power and deposit stickiness. Uh, and finally, I find that PIX increases consumers' welfare. So I find that average Brazilian would demand 380 US dollars to move back to the world without PIX. So they would want compensation if they were offered to just move back to, let's say, October 2020, when peaks did not exist. So let me conclude. Payment systems are developing around the world. They are developing in the US, they're developing in Mexico, in European Union, and the effects on banks are usually a key concern. So I find that uh, payment systems that are created by central banks can increase competition for deposits among banks. I show this uh, by analyzing peaks, and this has important implications for market power that banks have for lending competition, for monetary policy transmission, because monetary authorities care how much banks react to their policies. I find that peaks in Brazil leads to an increase in deposits and loans, especially of smaller banks, and reduction in bank interest rates.
This has important implications for choice of payment methods, what people like to use credit cards versus PICs versus maybe cash. And then of course, it's interesting to study what happens to consumers' welfare. Do people actually benefit from introduction of these digital payments and what are potential costs of their implementation? Thank you very much. I really enjoyed presenting here. Bom, dando sequência, então, ao nosso webinar, o próximo a falar vai ser Renato Gomes, que é o diretor de organização... The next person is Renato Gomes. He's a part of the Central Bank, among other responsibilities. He's also responsible for the policies of competition and innovation of the Central Bank. He has a PhD in economy with the Northwestern University before coming to the Central Bank. He was a professor of the Economy School of Toulouse. So, Renato, the floor is yours. Wonderful. So, uh, I would like to, to start thanking the, the organizers, uh, in particular, Edu Lopes and Rafaela Nogueira for having me here. It's always a pleasure to contribute to these events. And uh, I also uh, I always appreciate sharing the floor with Oton and Carolina and John. So, it's a, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, I also very much enjoyed uh, listening to, to Sergei, which work I, I in fact, knew before, uh, uh, before being invited to this event. I think it's, 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 it's essential to have uh, careful empirical work documenting the impact of public policies. And I, I think that's very helpful for, for everybody. Um, so uh, banking, uh, I'll make some comments on, on the on the topic of his paper and on the public policies that we've been uh, implementing in Brazil. So, so banking is obviously a, a multi-product business, right? In that it includes uh, uh, payments, it includes deposit and saving accounts, uh, it includes investment products, uh, financing and loan products, and, and the list could go on, right? So uh, many, many forces push consumers to, to what, uh, in economic jargon, uh, we call uh, one-stop shopping, right? Or, or basically selecting uh, one principal uh, bank to concentrate most activity, right? Which we call uh, often principality, right? So, so I, I can think of at least uh, three sources, right? One is complementarity among among the products that banks offer. So, so it's good to 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 make payments for a bank where you have your investments because if you need to. To, to, to get them back to, to, to immediate expenses. Uh, asymmetric information is another uh, reason for, for, let's say, one-stop shopping, in that information consolidation in a single institution is something that minimizes uh, uh, adverse selection, right? So, so it tends to reduce uh, interest rates for, for consumers. Of course, open finance is is very much helping in this respect but but it's a road it's it's a it's a, it's a continuum uh it's a continuing process right uh another uh a, a, another source towards uh, let's say one-stop shopping um is that uh consumers uh, often had to face transportation costs to move to branches i can see that my camera is is a bit funny can you see me I cannot see you, but I'm checking if the YouTube uh, members, I guess you can keep, I don't know, if, let me just check. I think you can, so why don't you know about uh, uh, okay. I'm just restarting the camera okay. to make sure. Uh, okay, we'll talk. is it better you... uh, Wonderful. So I was talking about transportation costs to go to branches as well, right? So so the, this, of course, uh, is, is, is always a reason uh, to concentrate activity in one bank, right? So, so for long, Brazil had uh, a network of bank branches that was very much concentrated around the the, the five largest uh, institutions, right? And this network of bank branches uh, uh, that was a crucial competitive tool for incumbent banks, and uh, one could say even that it could create an effective barrier to entry that prevented. Uh, uh, new institutions from from making progress uh, in the market, right? So another another source of uh, uh, let's say competitive hindrance in the in the Brazilian banking sector is the fact that banks' proprietary ATMs 
uh, they 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 were not interoperable. In fact, they they still were not interoperable. Uh, and that, of course, uh, let's say, creates network effects that that don't don't, don't help competition, right? So nowadays, uh, Pic Sac and Pic Stroke, they are trying to finally solve this issue, uh, uh, reducing uh, the importance of of holding uh, a large ATM proprietary network. So uh, around uh, uh, a decade ago, if you if you if you put these pieces together, uh, uh, one could say that Brazilians they they were strongly compelled uh, uh, to patronize one of the five major banks. Uh, as, as payments, especially person-to-person uh, -person payments, they relied heavily on cash. And efficiently dispensing cash is what was one of the most value-creating activities that incumbent banks uh, uh, could do. Right? So this scenario has been changing fast in recent years. Uh, a crucial landmark uh, has been the law 12865, uh, uh, which brought payments to the regulatory perimeter of, of the central bank and also created uh, uh, the figure of a payment service provider, which is which is a narrow bank, right? A bank that can collect deposits but cannot leverage, cannot lend. Uh, uh, and, 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 and so, so th these new institutions, they could offer uh, payment accounts facing uh, a lighter proportional regulatory burden, right? So that was very important to, to let's say, uh, to introduce more competition uh, in this market. Uh, after this law, uh, uh, PIX, I believe, has been the most consequential milestone in, in our road to a more competitive banking sector, as, as basically it offered consumers uh, the opportunity to digitalize P2P payments, person-to-person -person payments, which uh, substantially reduced the importance of cash in the in the daily lives of Brazilians, right? So, so, so basically, Pix, in my interpretation, rendered the banking the banking branch and the ATM advantages that large banks had uh, much less consequential, uh, uh, and and so uh, so consumers now they have a clear possibility. To, to, to choose beyond the large incumbent banks. And that's, I think, mostly due to the, the, the increasing unimportance of cash, right? So, so Sergey's paper uh, does, a, does a wonderful job in carefully demonstrating this causal effect uh, that PIX has on the degree of competition uh, among Brazilian banks and, and payment service providers, right, or bank-like uh, institutions. So uh, among the quantitative uh, takeaways, uh, the ones that impressed me the most, and the, the paper is really very rich, one is that doubling PIX transactions increases the share of checking and time deposits of small relative to large banks by 3.3 and 15%. So in time deposits increase by 15% of small relative to large banks when, when PIX doubles, right? So, so that, that, that's, that's very much in line with changes in national uh, concentration measures that the, the, the central bank uh, uh, advertises each year in the, in the banking sector uh, report. Uh, the effect of doubling PIX transactions is also uh, noteworthy for total uh, checking deposits. So, so Sergey shows that as, as, as PIX doubles, uh, uh, total checking deposits increases by almost 4%, which also echoes uh, internal data by the central bank, revealing that PIX introduces 70 million people doing digital transfers in the two years following uh, the launch. Uh, uh, crucially, and that's that's very important for financial inclusion, these effects they were the, the, they were the most pronounced among low-income people. So th there is also a, 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 the last finding of the paper, perhaps, uh, which is on the counterfactual exercise in the structural model, where Sergey shows that PIC's existence uh, generates a deposit equivalent welfare of $380 per quarter. That's that's really fascinating. That amounts to increasing GDP per capita of Brazil by 15%. So, so I really hope the politicians hear that when they decide central bank budget, because it's it's really a, a, a fantastic number. Uh, so, so when it when it comes to 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 policy uh, implications, it, it's important, however, to to appreciate that PIX alone does not do uh, uh, all this magic. From reading the paper, one can 
uh, perhaps easily conclude that fast payment systems or a well-designed fast payment system such as PIX uh, uh, is enough to produce all these results. Uh, uh, and, and in fact, uh, th th there are preconditions that have to be met. And I, I don't think I have, I have time to talk about all the preconditions, but I, I think one important precondition is the existence of a vibrant uh, fintech fringe uh, of competitors that are heavily investing in IT and offering prime banking apps when the fast payment system uh, uh, arrives. And, and that was, that was just certainly the case in Brazil and, and many members of Zeta perfectly exemplify what I'm saying uh, in that when PIX arrived, uh, 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 a new, uh, uh, a large fringe of competitors are just ready uh, to to potentialize all the benefits of this public digital infrastructure. So, so I, I think that at the end of the day, the the massive digitalization that followed PIX uh, uh, taught traditional incumbent banks as well as fintechs that uh, 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 this new payment system uh, is not a, is not a hindrance. To the, to the payment landscape, but by the very contrary, is increasing the size of the pie, is increasing the presence of Brazilians and the, the, the inclusion of Brazilians uh, in this market. And I, I believe it not, not only benefited Brazilian consumers, but also the industry saw value in, in this initiative. So I, I believe I should stop here. But thank you for having me. Obrigada, Renato, pela bela apresentação. Bom, dando sequência, então, eu vou chamar o Otto Moreno, que é diretor-geral de sistemas de pagamentos do Banco Sicu, que por mais de 20 anos desempenhou um papel ativo no desenvolvimento e avanço do sistema de pagamento do México. O diretor Otto fez parte do desenvolvimento e evolução do sistema de pagamentos eletrônicos interbancários, o SPAY, do cobro digital, do CODE, e do dispositivo móvel, do DIMO. O diretor Otom é provavelmente um dos servidores públicos que possui maior conhecimento dos sistemas de pagamentos mexicanos. Então, com isso, por favor, diretor Otom. Thank you. Thank you, Rafaela, for the, for the kind introduction. Uh, thank you also for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to, to, share the, to share the virtual space with Renato and with John and Carolina as well. I, to be honest, I don't like to follow Renato because he always says what I want to say and he, he does it way better than I do, but I'll, I'll try my best. Uh, I, think, I think this paper, Sergei's papers, give us a, a great opportunity uh, to discuss the positive effects of a fast payment system in the markets. And also allow us to discuss how the existence of these payment technologies allow the customers to choose uh, from service service providers in a more freely way. And, and, and that's precisely what Renato was talking about, uh, how you reduce this principality issue whenever choosing a payment service provider and also uh, allow, us, uh, allow the, the consumers to, to, to actually select what's going to be the best ser pay payment service providers and not necessarily based on, based on other, other factors uh, regarding the, the original size of the, of the, of the bank or the, or the fintech or, or whatever institution is providing the services. Also, also what is, is, is clearly shown in the paper and in many very elegant way is how this better access to payment services make more efficient the use of the deposits, make more competitive the market and allow, and allow smaller participants to actually make use of the lower entry costs to provide the services, bringing competition into the market. And, and of course, there's a lot of examples in the in the in the in the in the Brazilian in the Brazilian market, precisely because of the the paper is based on a fantastic introduction of PIX uh, a few years back. But, but I think that's the case. Whatever whatever you see the introduction of, of a payment technology that allow these lower entry costs, and and I think I think that's that's the main conclusion of the paper. And uh, but 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 I want to talk more generally about payment technologies and, and, and the potential of these payment to foster competition. Because if if Renato Renato explained, right, it's, it, there's, there's, a, there's a room for confusion. Let's say, okay, just introduce a fast payment system and you will get all these niceties into your market. It's, it's, it's not the case for any fast payment systems. It needs to be a well-designed payment system. It needs, it needs to be a, a properly thought upon 
payment system. And also in, 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 in Sergei's presentation, he, he also talked about a, a, a fast payment system introduced by a central bank. But, but perhaps, perhaps that might, I might disagree with him in that condition. It's, it's not that it was introduced by the central bank. It is a case of, in Mexico. It is a case in Brazil. It is a case in, 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 the, in the American uh, uh, implementation of, 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 of Fed now. But it's, that's not, I think that's not the common principle that, that allows a well-designed fast payment system to have these, all these benefits to the, to the market economies. Uh, can you can you help me uh, presenting the slides uh, so I can so I can have some help in the discussion? I think. Yeah. You can go. Yeah. You're looking at the slides now? I don't see the slides. They're over there. We can see the slides. It's on the payment system and competition. Oh, okay. I, I'm not I'm not looking at the at the proper screen then. Anyway, you, you can see the slides then. Uh can, can we go to the to the to the next to the next slide on, on the on the basic ecosystem principles, please. I think the main the, the main idea. Of, of what, what in general makes payment technology have this potential to foster competition, as it was explained in the paper, but all other economic ec economic activities to be fostered by a payment systems and in general by payment technology need to, need to share some, some as, 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 as Renato said, some preconditions, some preconditions of what we need to, uh, to, to, to actually make sure that these implementations can actually have the impact. And, and, this, and these are the principles that we, we have thought upon. Uh, same risk, same regulation. This is an outdated, uh, actually an outdated slide. This, this, this has changed. Uh, we, we need to talk about same risk, same regulatory outcome, right? Because same regulation used to be understood as you got to be subject to the exact same regulatory piece or the exact same law. That's not necessarily true. All you need to have the same the same the, the same conditions need to need to be regulated to make sure that everyone is playing in a in a in a level playing field, and and all the risks are are, are mitigated accordingly to the risks that any participant is bringing to the market. This, of course, is the case in Brazil. This is the case in Mexico. This is the case in Europe. Right, where we're pushing towards towards a more homogeneous regulation, and that allows, for example, what Renato was saying, to have these these fringe fintech institutions uh, being able to enter. In a secure way into the market, right? Because because precisely they were already there uh, with with the, with the proper regulation to, to to offer the services in a, in a, in a fast way. Now another another of the main principles is, is is about interoperability and neutrality, and this is this is key. This is key. Uh, having having a, a payment technology that is not inter interoperable and is not ne neutral. Would allow to even even in probably worse 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 scenarios of concentration. One of one of the one of the main uh, economists I have ever met in my life once when discussing about this, he once told me, if you have a market with multiple failures, addressing one of these failures without addressing the other failures or at least considering other failures in the implementation of your policy would actually lead to a worst outcome. And, and, and that's that's one of the issues that, that, that you can see here in interoperability. Uh, Sergei uh, said it perfectly well. Renato also said it perfectly well. It's also the case in Mexico. Financial markets are traditionally concentrated in a few key players, uh, five, six big players that provide services. If you, if, you, if you implement payment technologies without considering interoperability, what you can get is even a more concentration because those big players are in the better position to make use of these new technologies and provide the services to even a wider audience and a wider user uh, customer base and, and not allowing the smaller pro providers to actually enter the market and use that same payment technology could, could actually uh, fall into in a completely different situation what Sergei's Sir, Sir uh, showing his paper, right? You can have even less competition given this, this technology. And that might be the case of previous payment technologies that were implemented in a, a few decades ago. And, and 
we have talked about uh, ATM, uh, ATM networks. Uh, that was a technology and that was a payment technology that wasn't considering interoperability or neutrality uh, uh, for access. And, and, and it's one of the, of the reasons why we consider this might have make, make them the market more, even more concentrated uh, on, the, on, the, on, on, that, on that side, right? Uh, we, we need to make sure that we do not generate single winners, so we are the, the king makers. Right? Any any policy need to consider that there's going to be some some concent natural concent natural concentration in the market. We 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 live in a market with with natural monopoly conditions, uh, high uh, uh, fixed uh, cost for entry cost, low marginal cost, practically zero marginal cost for the provision of payment services, and that that. That puts us in the risk of having a, a kingmaker on, in a policy. Put a put a put a, a, a social policy that could lead to further and further concentration. We need to make sure that this doesn't happen. And, and this is one of the issues that has considering the development of, of modern payment uh, payment systems, right? But it's, it, it doesn't come natural. It's, it's got to be intentional to have some policies preventing for this to happen. Also, also the, the traditional idea, you need to have high operational continuity in service provision. You need to have proper customer protection. You need to have cyber security and cyber resilience management uh, to be to be fully implemented in the system. Why? Because this is this is this is a trust business as well, right? Any 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 impossibility of myself to make use of my deposits or my digital digital resources at the moment I need them to be just is because because the system is down uh, because my financial uh, service provider. Is not offering the services will, will 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 lead to a loss of confidence in that provider, right? So we need to make sure that the system is running fully 24/7 to make to to actually fulfill the demand of the public and the, and, and 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 to build trust. One of the issues that also these big banks already have is also the trust of the public. They they've been serving since my grandfather, my father, and myself for the past hundred years in in our jurisdictions, right? So they have already built that trust, but these smaller smaller service providers need to build that trust from, and, and and then we need to make sure that our service, our 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 uh, the payment services are, are there to meet the expectations of the of the customers, and of pro proper customer protection. Of course, it's it's key. Uh, sadly, when you when you make fast payment services available, you also you also allow. For, for new ways of, of, of financial flow, right? So we need to make sure that we have all, all, the, all the conditions in the system to avoid that for as much as possible. It's, it's, it, comes, it comes with the service. It's a new service. People are getting used to the new services. People are getting used to the, 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 to the new uh, payment channels to, to manage credentials, to manage in the app, we, we as, a, as, as a population, we do not know how to, how to operate in a, in a fast payment uh, environment, right? So, so we need to learn. And also the system needs to be there to protect those who are, so it takes more to learn. Uh, some some un, unprotected uh, parts of the population, the elderly, for example, but it, it's, 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 a new, it's a new way to, to uh, I've been doing this for the past 70, 60 years of my life and now you suddenly change the way I interact with my money. We need to take care of those, of, of, of those situations to make sure that again, to, to keep building the trust and the, of the consumers in these, in these new services. Can, can you help me to, to, to the, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna jump to the last slide, the one that's for one looking overview because, uh, because I'm running out of time. And I want to talk about what else we need to do because we have we have talked about fast payment systems, and that for sure has have many many niceties in the in the way we interact in the economy. And, and Renato explained it fairly well, and Sergei did a fantastic uh, empirical empirical job to, to to show that. But but there's more to that. There's more to that. I'm I'm not looking at the slides, so I'm I'm hoping I'm in the in the slide with the with the four one looking overview. Uh, we need we need to talk about digital identity. We need to, uh, and, and, and also a way to, to interact with the system. We need to, to, need to find a way. We're moving from cash, when, and, and when interacting with cash, I, I was sure who was I interacting with, because I can see the face. I can, I can in the exchange of the, 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 of the banknote, I can see the face in the exchange of the coins. 
But now when I'm interacting remotely with someone, I need to make sure who I'm talking to. And, and, and a way to do that is to start, start looking at the way digital identity is gonna shape the way we interact with our new money. We need to talk about open finance and Renato, Renato talk a little bit about it, right? How, how, how we need to set this, con this continuum uh, pace towards, towards bringing financial services wherever we want to use our financial services. Uh, I, I always try to, to, to explain open finance, said, imagine a world where no one had ever invented the box to go, right? The, the, when, whenever you go to a restaurant and you ask your food to go, uh, imagine a world when you cannot have that. You need to, you need to eat your burger right on that, uh, the place you're selling your burger. If you want a pizza, you have to go to the pizza place and eat the pizza there. Uh, and now, and now, and now imagine I want to I I watch the game or I want to eat it with my family. I, I don't want to eat it in the restaurant. I want it in my, in my living room. And imagine the restaurant saying, you know, no, that's not possible. You need to consume our services here. Well, that's exactly what's happening with financial services. I, I want to use your services, bank, but I don't want to use it in your infrastructure. I want it in my own terms and conditions. And the bank is telling you, no, no, you got to consume it here. All right? Well, we need to change that. And, 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 and open finance is a way to change that and to keep fostering competition, to keep providing better access to the public. Uh, we, we need to go talk about these new clear and settlement infrastructures like like PIX and, and, and SPAY and FEC now, but they need to evolve and then and to keep growing and providing new services and capability. And, and finally, we need to talk about the digital money, the, the, the new ways and new technologies that we provide these services to the public, right? I'm going to stop here because I, I think I, I run a, little, a, two, a couple of minutes uh, over the, the allotted time, but but thank you for the, for the opportunity to talk about these issues again. Fantastic paper of Sergey, uh, and, and I hope I did a good a good job trying to explain what what's next and what other preconditions are needed, just not for the fast payment services. And thank you, thank you again, uh, Rafaela, for the for the time. Obrigada, Diretor Otom. Bom, então dando sequência agora, nós teremos uma apresentação do John Frost, que é chefe de economia para as Américas do BIS na cidade do México of John Cross. He is from Mexico. He, he leads uh, a team of analysts and economists with relevant positions in North America and South America. And we also have Carolina Dalaskis, who is an economist, a visiting person from Mexico. She does researches about innovation, digital innovation, and collaborative activities about these issues between central banks and the region. So let's have follow the sequence with John and Carolina. Thanks so much, Rafaela. <clears throat> and uh, thank you to the organizers. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, also to share the virtual stage with Renato, with uh, Otom, uh, Sergey, and, um, and Eduardo. So um, as, uh, as Rafaela mentioned, um, I had uh, the Economics for the Americas team uh, here at the BIS Americas office in Mexico City. And I'm joined today with Carolina Velasquez. And we'll be responding to uh, Serke's uh, presentation and paper very briefly, but then also drawing on some of the research that we do uh, here at the BIS, drawing on the experience from different countries in the Americas region and beyond, uh, particularly around the design and adoption of fast payment systems. I'll use a slide deck, so I will start sharing my screen now. Very good. Okay, and uh, as I said, uh, we'll uh, we'll start by giving a, a few uh, remarks, uh, uh, feedback uh, on the paper by uh, by Sergey, and for that, I will actually hand the floor over to Carolina. So yeah, thank you, John. So we will start uh, by sharing some thoughts on on Sergey's paper. So uh, it presents. Very interesting evidence on, on how PIX uh, has led to a decline in, in deposit market concentration and, and has uh, contributed to enhance the, the ability of small banks to offer payment convenience. And this, of course, comes with, with several policy uh, implications. And uh, the study also offers uh, novel insights to, to a relatively unexplored uh, research field, which is precisely the, the impact of, of fast payment systems. And um, it provides a, a, a novel approach to, to estimate causal effects uh, using COVID-19 restrictions and, and, and it 
uh, has sound evidence on, on the underlying mechanisms of the result. Uh, so overall, we found the paper very interesting and it was very challenging to find uh, specific weaknesses. However, the paper uh, inspired us to think about some other areas of, for th of uh, future research on, on the impact of FPS. Uh, so for example, uh, banks profitability, we've seen that in some uh, jurisdictions, banks uh, are reluctant to, to FPS due to concerns related to a decrease in payment rents. So this, this would be interesting also to look at. Uh, and other issues also include uh, financial stability, specifically regarding uh, speed of runs, uh, outcomes for individuals and businesses, and the conditions for, for a level playing field. Now, uh, let's dive into the trends in, in fast payments adoption. So, uh, FPS are transforming the payments landscape and, and are a key innovation with tangible uh, benefits for their users. Yet, there are strong differences in, in adoption rates across jurisdictions with uh, Thailand, uh, Brazil, South Korea uh, leading in terms uh, of uh, fast payment volumes. And at the same time, the rise in, in FPS uh, has coincided with, with a fall in, in cash use, particularly in countries where, where FPS have been implemented, which highlights the increasing uh, digitalization of payments. So uh, this uh, popularity of, of FPS uh, stems from, from a wide range of benefits, uh, ranging from convenience and efficiency to broader uh, policy objectives, such as uh, fostering competition, as we've seen, and enhancing uh, financial inclusion. Moreover, uh, FPS exhibit a significant uh, network effects that are intrinsic to payments and become uh, more valuable as adoption expands. Um, so for, for this reason, uh, the uh, collaborative efforts between central banks and the private sector are crucial in, in FPS implementation and enables their reconciliation of competing goals in the provision of, of FPS. And uh, back to you, John. Thanks a lot, Carolina. So um, we've talked already about the experience in Brazil, the experience of PICS, and um, you know, I just wanted to underscore what Sergey and, and Hanato have already said about just how remarkable the speed of adoption has been. So um, you know, just in the first year, we saw that um, you know, uh, over 65% of uh, users had adopted um, PICS. We saw a very large increase in total bank clients with active operations, that's shown here on the left in red. Um, in the meantime, so since uh, since uh, you know the, this graph was made, it's actually increased even further, and we see about uh, you know over 90% of, of Brazilian adults now using PIX. Uh, in their you know very impressive numbers about the number of people who've been brought into the financial system who've made their first digital transaction ever, and you know we see I think very strong adoption by households, by businesses across the country, um, and so this is a very inspiring and really remarkable uh, example. And as Sergey had mentioned, you know, the cost to merchants of accepting PIX payments is much lower. So it's about 22 basis points on average versus about 2.2% for credit cards and about 1.1% for debit cards. And what's more, merchants get the money right away. So they have access to the funds uh, immediately. And um, of course, this is a big advantage. Uh, it means that they need less credit, you know, to pay for working capital. Uh, they have uh, better cash flow. And this is also a real tangible benefit for, uh, for businesses. But let's look at a few other examples in the region. Another you know, remarkable success case is Costa Rica, where mass adoption of Simpe Mobile has come with greater competition in the banking system as well. Uh, again, uh, this is, I think, consistent with the results that Sergei showed for, for Brazil. So you can see on the left-hand panel that as Simpe Mobile has gone up, cash use has gone down. In the middle panel, you see the herfindahl hirschman index of market concentration has fallen quite a bit. And then on the right side, you see that bank expenses were notably lower than in the counterfactual. And this uh, draws on uh, research with Douglas Araujo, uh, Carlos Cantu, Cecilia Franco, and colleagues from the uh, Central Bank of Costa Rica using a synthetic controls methodology. What we show in any case is that the actual non-interest expenses to gross income have been notably lower uh, than in a counterfactual without CPA mobile. Now, um, 
why has uh, FPS adoption been, been so high in, um, in some countries? Um, in recent work uh, in the BIS uh, quarterly review, uh, and this is joint work with, uh, with Catalina, uh, we show that uh, FPS adoption features are associated with, uh, with greater adoption. And so this is a regression table. I'll, I'll just walk through um, and, and show you know, what, what to get out of the uh, individual stars, the individual rows. If we look first at the very bottom row, governance, public FPS, this refers to fast payment systems that are um, operated by the central bank, like PIX, like Simpe Mobile, uh, like Cody in Mexico for that matter. And here we find that these are much more adopted with higher monthly uh, per capita volumes of transactions. We also find a positive impact of higher number of use cases, higher number of cross-border connections, and greater non-bank PSP participation. In particular, in cases like Brazil, where non-banks are able to uh, take part in the system, this is associated with higher adoption. And we wanted to um, just give a few uh, key policy insights uh, for fast payment systems and potentially for other payment infrastructures uh, beyond. So, um, you know, I, I mentioned this result uh, about publicly owned or central bank operated FPS, and I take Oton's point that, you know, uh, this isn't uh, always the case. There are, of course, many uh, fast payment systems operated by the private sector that have also been successful. But publicly owned FPS may prioritize a public good perspective. They may open aim for open, inclusive, and competitive payment markets. And that probably explains why we've seen such success in a few of these cases. Secondly, a user-centric approach addressing diverse needs such as peer-to-peer -peer transactions, merchant payments, and cross-border transactions is very important. Uh, in some jurisdictions, cross-border transactions are, you know, like remittances or trade are, are crucial. That's, that's certainly the case here in Mexico, uh, but also in other jurisdictions, uh, allowing for more cross-border connections can create more demand that can help uh, systems take off. The inclusion of non-bank providers may improve access for, uh, for underserved customers. Again, uh, non-banks may offer uh, new types of interfaces. They may increase competition. But beyond this, public-private collaboration is vital in providing FPS. And keeping these design features in mind may help us to build strong public infrastructures that are widely adopted and achieve their public policy goals. Um, in the future, FPS integration within payment infrastructures can stimulate innovation in digital finance we're very excited about the work that's being done in Brazil, also with the digital real, uh, with the other uh, elements of the uh, BC hashtag object, um, agenda. And so we're very uh, keen to see how PIX, together with these other initiatives, will contribute to a more innovative and more inclusive financial sector going forward. So I'll stop here and I'll hand back to Rafaela. Break. Obrigada, John e Carolina. Bom, a gente vai para a parte final agora do webinar, em que eu vou fazer uma pergunta para cada panelista, e eu vou começar com o diretor Renato. We're going to the final part, and I'm going to ask a question to each panelist. Renato, which were the key initiatives that the central bank did and that made for the rapid adoption of this system? Muito obrigada. relied mostly on cash. Uh, so, so PIX filled this gap, uh, and for a number of reasons that I'm going to describe right now, uh, uh, PIX put consumers on board uh, first. So adoption among consumers was really, was really fast, which created a strong network effects for the scheme uh, uh, in the P2P market, let's say. And then now we're gradually, gradually moving uh, to the, the person to, to merchant market, uh, uh, since with consumers on board, uh, merchants, they can more easily uh, join the system, uh, basically because the network effects are there and enjoy the cost advantages that PIX payments uh, uh, provide. So, so uh, to the point that nowadays, uh, it, it, that's recent, that has three or four months, uh, the, the, the proportion of, of P2M transactions is just above P2P transactions. In the beginning, P2P dominated, and now P2M uh, is catching up, and in fact, it's, it's leading uh, the, let's say, the cross-section of transactions. Uh, but the, the, uh, responding more directly to the question on, on the, 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 the reasons for fast adoption, I think that the, the, there is a number of design features that contribute to this outcome. One 
is that the Pix had a single brand identity, right? So, so uh, all, all banks, they, they were offering Pix. They were not offering different uh, instant payment services that interoperate. No, they, they, they were all, they all shared the same brand. Uh, there was also uniformity on, on the user experience, right? So, so, so institutions had to offer Pix in a similar way so that consumers could understand that it's the same product offered across institutions and that there is as well a public, a public infrastructure behind the system for settlement, of course, uh, making sure that that the credibility that's needed for, for this type of initiative is there. So the central bank is lending its credibility to this initiative, right? So so this the, the, the standardization uh, 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 it really helps commoditizing uh, fast payment system, the, the fast payment system experience, right? So 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 that was that that, that was very important for for overall understanding by consumers. Uh, there there are also multiple use cases, right? So you can you can make a P2P transfer with Pix using the alias of the receiver, or you can read the QR code of the receiver that that that, that applies well to to the P2P. P2M case, or you can use uh, e either for electronic commerce or for over-the-counter, uh, uh, for an over-the-counter purchase. Uh, you, you can also use the copy and paste functionality of PIX. That's, that, that, that's, that's very important for the, the mobile application, right? So, so for purchasing things in the, in the cell phone, the copy and paste is, is really uh, uh, is really convenient, right? So, so this variety of use cases uh, uh, made made Pix uh, a, a very natural choice in in many situations, right? Uh, from a, a regulatory perspective, the mandatory participation of institutions with more than five hundred thousand accounts is something that, that 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 was really important to create these network effects from the beginning. So, the, the, there was not uh, uh, the the, the, the let's say commercial interests could not hinder adoption so the compulsory participation was was very important to make sure that availability was there from from the the the, the you know from moment zero right the fact that it's an open scheme is also is also very important. So not only those institutions that had to adopt PICS on a mandatory basis, but also entrant institutions, small institutions or credit unions or small permanent service providers, they all could join PICS under equal conditions. So that, that was that was fundamental to bring PICS to, to all niches of, of the, the Brazilian uh, financial system. Uh, the governance uh, uh, controlled, the, the governance of the scheme, uh, which is entirely controlled by the central bank as the scheme owner, is also, was also very important to coordinate expectations. That, of course, does not mean that the central bank is doing things, uh, 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 let's say, alone or without listening to the market. That's that's that, that, that it's by the very contrary. Uh, we have something called the Pix Forum, which uh, uh, which is a regular uh, it's a regular meeting with market participants on very different topics of the payment scheme, where the central bank exchanges, uh, especially regarding the evolutionary agenda and how to design the next features of the system and even how to to, to let, let's say to do the, the housekeeping of, of the system right uh, uh, another crucial ingredient for fast adoption especially among consumers was that it was free for individuals so so Pix uh, since the beginning was as cheap as cash uh, but but of course much better right and and I would say that last but not least uh, uh, Pix was was quite timely in in helping Brazilians at the time of the pandemic, right? So, so uh, uh, the sanitary conditions were such that digitization was not a was not a choice. It was it was basically uh, an obligation to 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 protect oneself, and and it, it, it's a, it's a happy coincidence that Pix was available just then, and 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 could help us uh, go through that different that that difficult period. Uh, 
So, uh, 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 of course, the, the, the emergency aid benefits, they are also uh, uh, paid during the pandemic and many accounts were opened precisely uh, uh, so, so that the, poor, the, the, the low income people could, could, could have access to these benefits and combined with digitization, uh, 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 PIX was, was very helpful in, in, let's say, in channeling these funds to the economy. So, so I, I think all these features and, 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 and let's say, in context, uh, explain the, the rapid adoption. So I, I should stop here. Obrigada, Renato. Bom, agora vou fazer minha pergunta para o Thank you, Renato. Now I'm going to ask my question to my other colleague. What impacts did you have in the competition of the Mexican banking sector and how do you expect them to develop in the future? Thank you. Thank you, Rafaela, for the for the for the question. As I think as as, as we've been discussing for the past hour how how, how payment systems actually shape competition in the market, I think we can we can we can have we have had a similar impact with the implementation of SPAY. Uh, I, mean, it's, I think it's, it's, it's fair to have a little bit of context for this question, right? SPAY was introduced in the, in the Mexican market 20 years ago. In fact, this year we're celebrating our 20th anniversary of, of what first was our RTGS, the wholesale payment system, what rapidly became a, a fast payment system with the, with the retail perspective. Now, now the, uh, uh, the majority of payments that are processed in the system are, are retail payment systems. So that, that, that is also our, our fast payment system. Um, and I think through, through, the, through the years of implementation, 20 years ago, yeah, let's, let's try to imagine how, how the world was 20 years ago. Well, to, to, to remember those who are old enough, and to imagine those who are young and know how the world was 20 years ago, there was no smartphones. Maybe that's hard to, to, to figure out a world without a smartphone. There were cell phones, but they don't have internet connection or a reliable internet connection. There was no apps, let alone banking apps 20 years ago, right? So, so, so the implementation of a fast payment system 20 years ago was, was quite a different challenge that it is today, it, it, and 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 Spay at the beginning accompanied the digitalization of the Mexican population. There was no 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 network ready to interact with uh, with what will become a person to person or a person to business kind of payment. Uh, it it needs to build up from the from the ground up and 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 start and start developing financial services. Uh, as as the technology of the telecommunications technology evolved and got adopted in the Mexican market, so so one of the in, main impacts of 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 the competition was precisely allow uh, as the as the digital service financial services were developing to 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 allow for for these digital services to be developed in a in a in an interoperable way, right? First within banks. Avoiding or, or trying to counter, con, 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 counteract that principality effect that Renato took about, right? Allow, allow, allow all the banks to be able to share resources among 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 themselves, uh, regardless of the of the of the of the issuer or the receiver of recipient of the payment. That that was very particular of Mexico 20 years ago. Having a having a centralized infrastructure governed by the central bank that allow payments to flow within users uh, in in two thousand and seven, right? It's it was it was a, it was very very particular of the Mexican market, and uh, and 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 that allowed for the for the, for the for the market to develop in a, in, a, in a different competition uh, competition uh, environment. Now more more recently, uh, we we also push. For, for for new technologies that that, that, that reduce the cost of, of infrastructure at the point of sale that's our QR implementation that and, and, and now it is, it's a widely implemented solution across the jurisdictions that that's what is called in Mexico right the QR implementation of a fast payment system supported by Spain 
And then the, the, the alias database uh, that's also being implemented in, in Brazil and Argentina, uh, uh, that, that, that what, what the demo is, right? So, so those, those extra functionalities of the fast payment system in the country are also allowing for, 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 the, for, the, for, the, for the provision of financial services uh, and then reducing the entry barriers for small, small institutions or non-bank institutions, and I think, and I think that's that's where you see this impact more clearly. The 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 the, the provision of services by non-traditional payment service providers. We're talking about fintech, simony issuers, and and even even uh, fully digital banking institutions, uh, the institutions that can now provide services without having a, a physical branch, a, a brick a brick and mortar branch. Institutions that cannot provide services without having an ATM, uh, because most of the services can be can be actually provided through the fast payment system that is accessible to them. The direct connection they can they can have to the system, but also uh, the tier participation provision of services in the in, in the in the fast payment system that also allow for even even smaller institutions like credit unions, or for example, niche institutions that could provide the services. Through the through a third party that connects them to the, to the fast payment service, that also you can see how how this is evolving, and you and you see how these institutions are actually gaining share in the in the in the in the financial services market in Mexico precisely because they have this lower entry lower entry cost to the to the to the solutions that the central bank is offering. Uh, we we have we have seen now the the decline in the use of ATMs. Uh, John. You don't show the, the graph of how in Costa Rica you have the, the, the reduction in the in the ATM. You, you, you have a similar graph uh, for for Mexico, and that's precisely because of the, the the introduction of these new services. And and now and now you don't need a, a ATM branch to actually compete in retail services in the country. And and you, and you can see that precisely because of Demo, because of Cody, because of Spay, that allow for the for the users to to actually exchange their resources without this 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 use of the 20th century technology. Right? So I think I think I think the, the, the short answer, Rafaela, is Spay since 20 years ago, Cody since five years ago, uh, Demo most recently. How are they how are they pushing for competition is to reduce the entry costs, reduce the need for outdated technology to provide services, ATMs, physical branches. And allow for the provision of more efficient and more uh, modern technology uh, for the provision of services and, and granting access to all institutions, bank and non banks, big and small, through direct participation or indirect or tier participation in the systems to provide those services are, are, are fostering the provision of services and competition in the country. Thank you very much. To finalize the questions, I'm going to ask a question to John and Carolina. Based on international evidence, what's the role of the central banks? What can they do to develop instant payment methods that are a success and adopted on both sides of the network? where we look at the transactions per capita in different jurisdictions in fast payment systems. So in Brazil, in Mexico, in uh, Thailand and countries around the world. And we were really interested in why is it that adoption has taken off so much in some countries and less so in others. And so as mentioned, I mean, the, the four things that we found very clearly were first that when the central bank operates the payment system, uh, the fast payment system, that's very effective. Second, when there's more use cases, um, that's been very helpful also more cross-border use cases, and then the participation by non-banks. So in particular, when we allow uh, non-banks also to take a part in the system, as is the case in Brazil. Um, unfortunately, that's not the case, for instance, in the US with FedNow. Um, so FedNow only allows banks uh, to take part. Um, and so that's that's a, a key difference, I think, with uh, FIX in Brazil. There were a few things that we couldn't quite measure that we didn't really have an indicator for. And so uh, we, we think we have a hunch that these are very important, but we can't really show it in the, in the cross country regressions. And one of the key ones is mandatory participation by large banks. So Hanato talks about this, um, and I think Sergey did as well, that um, 
in Brazil, because of the payments law, uh, it was possible to require banks with more than 500,000 customers to be part of FIX. And that really set off network effects competition that you know, also encouraged smaller banks uh, to sign up. Um, again, that's a difference with the United States. Uh, in the United States, uh, FedNow is, is voluntary. The, the Federal Reserve System is working very hard to bring more uh, banks on board. But of course, that's, uh, that is a difference where you know, in the US, uh, this isn't mandatory per se. We think that this is likely to, to play a, a key role as well. And I think that you know, in many jurisdictions, there's been very successful branding, uh, very successful um, you know, uh, mechanisms to, to make for a, a consistent user experience across uh, different institutions. So PIX you know, has uh, very clear uh, branding. You know, it's very, uh, very uh, user-friendly and, and very easily accessible from different bank apps, from non-bank apps, uh, et cetera. And so I think that's been a very successful feature uh, of PIX. I think that's also been something that we see in, in jurisdictions in Asia, like Thailand, where um, the FPS have really taken off. I'm going to turn to Carolina. I think that she also has some, uh, some additional thoughts on this, um, on you know, what central banks uh, can do and what's been successful. Mm, yes, John. So I, I think that an additional uh, point that, that is important is uh, public awareness and, and education. Uh, uh, central banks can, can educate both uh, financial institutions and the general public uh, on, on the benefits of functionalities of, of instant payment methods. And this could also encourage uh, adoption and, and usage. Uh, yep. Probably regulation is also another point, uh, regulation that really encourages uh, innovation and competition uh, while also uh, protecting consumers and, and financial stability. Bom. Obrigada, então, John e Carolina. Thank you very much, John and Carolina. I'm going to give the floor for the final words to Leila Colso. Thank you. Very Thank much. you. Well, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, this panel has offered interesting views on how universally available instant payment systems can enhance banking competition and how uh, this can benefit consumers. Increasing financial inclusion through banking competition directly improves well being, which is today panel is so uh, which is why this panel today is so important. Given the conclusions we reached today, we must further reflect on how we can accelerate the adoption of instant payments. What else can be done by both the public and the private sectors to have a universally available instant payment system? They, uh, Basen and Banxico have played an active roles, roles on this sense, and there's still a lot of opportunity on other, for other countries to learn from the PICS experience based on Sergei's paper and on the idea that we were so brilliantly exposed by our panelists today. Let's leave this conversation open. Discussing success cases and learning from other countries is key to improving the financial sector in the region. Mexico Exponential and CETA's collaboration aims to facilitate the exchange of ideas and best practices. I would like to thank our speakers and Rafaela for sharing their ideas. I also want to thank all of you who listened to this panel. We will share the conclusions, the conclusions of this panel in our websites. And we invite you to stay tuned to the other events that by organized by Mexico Exponential and Zeta to promote the digitalization of the financial sector to achieve a more inclusive financial system. Thank you very much to all of you. <laughs>